bowling. It's basically human nature. People came up with bowling before we came up with written language, money, or making horses fight in our wars. And over the years, new technologies improved the game. Bowling balls replaced rocks, computers replaced paper scorekeeping, and someone invented those swingy chairs I love. But a new new technology might ruin it all. Strings. Yep, strung up pins are the hot new controversy in the bowling world. But what are they for? And are they ruining the game or saving it? I sent my outside correspondent Amy outside for answers, but before we get to her very important research, let's set the stage. Or rather, the pins. Back in the day, underpaid teens set up pins by hand, but in 1946, AMF introduced a two ton, nine foot tall machine that could count, clear, and reset pins on its own. And while it took more electricity than your average teen, the automatic pin setter eventually replaced pin boys all over the country. Models vary, but here's basically how it works. There are five main parts. A sweep, a pin elevator, a pin distributor, a pin table, and a ball accelerator. The ball accelerator just shoots your ball back to you, but the other four parts juggle a total of 20 pins around, collecting them, organizing them, and setting them up. First, it puts down 10 pins. When you bowl, the ball passes a sensor which says, hey, there's a ball here, so the pin setter drops its sweep in front to block any sneaky bonus balls. At the same time, a camera records how many and which pins are standing so the pin table, basically a set of 10 holders with tongs, can descend and pick them up. Then Mr. Sweep sweeps, the table sets its pins back down, and the felled ones write a conveyor belt to an elevator to the pin distributor, which would load them up and prepare them to be set back down, but it's actually full right now, so they just keep writing. Now you bowl again and don't hit anything because you suck at this, so the pin distributor releases three replacement pins into the pin table, which sets all ten up for the next player. Up above, pins come off the elevator and into the distributor, and the cycle repeats. Seems complicated? It is! Automatic pin setters have over 4,000 moving parts, including three motors and a shark switch, which I'm told is a mostly unremarkable piece of plastic, but I see it as this. Yes, I spent the last of my graphics budget on that. Parts alone can cost a bowling alley $3,000 a month, on top of all the electricity pin setters take and the full-time mechanic you need to tend to them. In the last few decades, bowling's popularity has waned, and these costs have gotten harder and harder for alleys to bear. Enter the string pin setter. These bad boys have fewer than 75 moving parts, and you don't need a mechanic. When they need a fix, it's usually just the front desk team untangling some strings. Between labor, parts, and power, string pin setters can save bowling alleys up to 90% versus freefall pin setters, with the added bonus that they don't crush people to death. So the financials are good, but what about the game? Surely stringing up the pins affects the physics, right? Congrats, you found the controversy. Once upon a time, string pin setter manufacturers asked the United States Bowling Congress to certify strings for tournament play, and the Congress spent two years on research to decide under what specifications they might allow it. They came up with several, including that the strings needed to be 54 inches, or about 140 centimeters, to prevent them from interfering in pinfall. Also, they need to have a curtain or other arresting device 14 to 18 inches, or about 40 centimeters from the end of the lane to prevent string-related ricochet from knocking down too many pins. With these and other specs in place, the USBC found that their robot bowler named Earl bowled 7.1 fewer strikes and scored around 10 fewer points per game on strings. Bowlers took this, as you might imagine, badly, but the USBC still wanted to certify, so they did a massive study with 541 bowlers playing 3,550 games, half on strings and half on freefall, and used the resulting paired data to make a 19-page document explaining whether strings actually ruined everything. Their study found that the average difference between a player's scores on one type of pin setter versus another was less than one, and they declared strings clear for tournament play. For all you stat heads, they ran a paired t-test and got a mean of negative 0.0951 with a p-value of 0.035, and their 95% confidence interval spanned zero, which was a huge slay for the null hypothesis. And I'm sorry I said all that, but one of my writers got most of a stats degree and has got to use it somehow. And while said writer didn't finish her stats degree, she did enough to know that good results are replicable, or at least that's what she told me when she took my credit card to go bowling four times. Like in the study, Amy made all the players pick one bowling ball weight and stick to it for every throw in all four games. This, in theory, eliminates a possible source of variance, but oops, three of them picked needlessly heavy ones and proceeded to bowl disastrously for much of the experiment. They played on strings first, and while the sound on these things isn't nearly as fun as it is on freefall, the group couldn't deny that the game was perfectly fun, normal, and fast-moving, complete with classic bowling alley graphics and solid mozzarella sticks that I hope I didn't pay for. With two games down, they headed to the next bowling alley, 
an old school place whose free fall pin setters have been there since 1950. Here you score by hand, pins sometimes get stuck on the side and do this, and the guy had to come fix the pin setter manually six times. Qualitatively, the group had a blast at both places and would go back in a heartbeat. We're not here for fun. We're here for numbers. Each player won one of the four games. As far as spares and strikes go, the average differences were small, with the group getting an irrelevant 0.375 more strikes and 0.25 fewer spares on strings. In the overall scores, Amy scored much higher on the strings, while the other three did worse, one only slightly, the others a lot. In total, their average score was 3.6 pins higher on free fall than strings, but with a p-value over 0.6 and a confidence interval that spans zero, this test has no statistical significance and agrees with the Bowling Congress study. You know, to the extent it does anything, which it doesn't. Also, not for nothing, around the eighth frame of the group's last game, they put Freebird on the jukebox and all started bowling way better, adding a new source of uncounted for variance. Aren't stats magical? So, string pin setters, are they ruining bowling? If you ask the US Bowling Congress, Amy or Amy's little friends, no. The sound is worse, but the alleys like them, and the game plays basically the same. And while something doesn't sit right about having pins on strings, they get bonus points for not crushing anyone to death. I know this video wasn't about this, but regular pin setters really do crush a lot of people to death. So if not doing that anymore ruins the game, maybe the game was ready to be ruined. Remember all that stat stuff we were talking about in a minute ago? T-tests, confidence intervals, p-values? If you're like me and are not so math inclined, all these things sound like nonsense. But they don't have to, thanks to this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Just ask Amy. Learning stats in a formal academic setting doesn't work for everyone. But Brilliant's quick, intuitive, interactive courses let you go at your own pace, get a little smarter every day, and explore whatever STEM thing you're interested in without the high stakes and headaches of, say, a stats degree that you think might be trying to kill you. Just as an example. If you want to better understand the very study we focused on in this video, check out their course on hypothesis testing, which covers stuff that came up in this video, like the null hypothesis and variance, and stuff we had to skip, like statistical power and ANOVA tables. These topics aren't just interesting, they provide the basis for decisions as important as letting league bowlers use strings, as trivial as approving new medicines, and everything in between. So if you want to understand the world a little better, or even just this video, I can't recommend Brilliant enough. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash HAI or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, and you'll be supporting this channel too.